Good morning. We are going to do a combination Bible study and a time of intercessory prayer for our first session today. Uh, and then we'll have a break and we'll go into the uh, regular service with communion and the message. Now, the Bible study that we're going to do this morning is going to be um, connected uh, with the sermon. So this will be a part one, and that'll be a part two. We are studying Isaiah 40 through 66 at the Lord of the Harvest, and we are... <clears throat> Uh, looking particularly right now at Isaiah 40 through 55, which is 2nd Isaiah. 2nd Isaiah being a single prophecy, 40 through 55. And then 3rd Isaiah is 56 through 66. That is also a prophecy. 1st Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 1 through 39, which is the historical life of Isaiah. So we're going we're gonna to look at um, chapter 53 today of Isaiah. That's the suffering servant passage. Uh, what we have are four servant songs or servant texts where this figure, the servant of the Lord, emerges in uh, Isaiah 40 through 55. The whole point of Isaiah 40 through 55 is the Lord returning his people from exile. They have been under the domination, the political domination of Babylon, and now the Lord is returning them as he spoke through Jeremiah and through, of course, Isaiah here. He's returning them to their land, and Isaiah 40 through 55 speaks of the Lord. It's a, it's a new revelation of Yahweh. He's the God of all the nations of the earth. He raises up Babylon he sends his people into exile, and he returns them from exile. And within this, these chapters, these 16 chapters, 40 through 55, there are four servant songs. And it is in this, those four servant songs that the prophetic foreshadowing of Jesus comes to the forefront. The, the, tr traditionally, the four servant songs are Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9, and Isaiah 42, 1 through 9, Matthew quotes in Matthew 12, and Matthew uses Isaiah 42, 1 through 9 to be a summary of Jesus' ministry, Matthew 12. And then also in Matthew 8, he uses the description from Isaiah 53, which is the fourth servant song as a description of Jesus' ministry. So it's, it's very clear that the early church saw these four servant songs as being, as referring to the, the, the coming ministry of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Man, the servant of the Lord. So the first servant song is Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. The second servant song is Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. The third servant song is Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 11. And then the last one we're going to look at right now, it's Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. Now, in those four servant songs, in servant song number one, the servant brings justice to the earth. In the second servant song, the servant gathers all of Israel and all of the nations of the earth to the Lord. In the third servant song, Isaiah 50, the servant of the Lord himself is discipled by the Lord, and then he in turn is going to create more disciples. He's discipled by the Lord, and he's going to disciple others to be future servants of the Lord. And then Isaiah 52 and 53, of course, it's the suffering of the servant that accomplishes all of that. And I, I, I want to just read through this briefly, and then we're going to pray into it. Isaiah 52, 13, See, my servant shall act wisely. Now that word, act wisely, can be translated three different ways. My servant shall act wisely. My servant shall 
prosper in fulfilling the purposes of the Lord. And the third translation is, my servant shall be beatified. To be beatified means to be exalted in the heavenly places, lifted up and carried up into the heavenly places and exalted in the presence of the Lord to divine kingly status. So this servant, ultimately, he's going to be brought into the presence of the Lord. The next part of that verse says, he will be exalted, he will be carried, and he will be lifted up on high, highly exalted. He will be lifted up, highly exalted, and carried by the Lord. Now, it's interesting, that's the same term that is used when Isaiah in chapter 6 saw the Lord high and lifted up. Two of those three terms. The Lord was high and lifted up. Now the servant is going to be high and lifted up, brought into the presence of the Lord to fulfill the purposes of the Lord, installed as a king, beatified. And you're going to see what the significance of beatified is at the end of this fourth servant song. The third verb that's used to describe him is he'll be carried by the Lord. He will be born by the Lord. Now he is born by the Lord so that he can carry out those purposes, so that he can be beatified, so that he can act wisely. He's going to be carried and born by the Lord so that he can carry and bear other things by the Lord. But then there's a real contrast here. This this one who's going to be exalted into the kingly presence of the Lord, if you look at his circumstances, if you look at his earthly circumstances, it conveys the exact opposite. Just as many were dismayed over you, so disfigured you were, you no longer even looked human. The Hebrew talks about a horrible disfigurement to where this servant who's going to be beatified doesn't even appear to be a human being. Now, we know that Isaiah 52 and 53 here is a picture of Jesus' crucifixion. Keep that in mind. All of this is going on in the courtroom of the Lord. Just as Daniel 7, the Son of Man, comes into the courtroom of the Lord and receives the kingdoms of the world, Isaiah 40 through 55, the entire 16 chapters is a courtroom situation where all of these individuals, the nations of the earth, Israel, the heavenly council, the gods of the nations, Babylon, Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, all of these individuals, including the servant of the Lord, is brought into the throne room of Yahweh's judgment, and Yahweh decides how human history is going to go. We also know, as I've just mentioned, this is a prophecy about the crucifixion. So much here speaks of the horrible and terrible suffering that Jesus went through, the beatings, the disfigurement, the, 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 the mistreatment, um, the, the, the disfiguration. So there's this contrast beatified in the presence of the Lord, but on earth, first of all, suffering, disfigured. Verse 15 says, So shall this one who no longer looks like a human being, in verse 14, and an interesting thing about the last part of verse 14 says, and his form is not like the form of a human being, the form of a son of man. And see, even the title Son of Man, which we'll see in Daniel 7, which Jesus applied to himself, is also here in Isaiah 52, 53. And yet in his disfigurement, in his suffering, he shall sprinkle many peoples, many nations he shall sprinkle. Standing over him, kings will shut their mouths. A king would shut their mouth, a person would shut their mouth, when someone of great power and authority and royalty, a great emperor, a great person uh, in terms of political authority would walk by, people would close their mouths. In this case, the kings of the earth are closing their mouths at this servant 
but they may not be closing their mouth because they're in awe of his great power. It's because they're stunned. They're terrified. The language here to describe the suffering servant, they're terrified at how he looks. And yet, he's going to sprinkle them. There's going to be something that deals with the sin issue here in this suffering that the servant of the Lord experiences. They'll shut their mouths and truly what they had not been told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. It's a reversal of Isaiah 6 where Isaiah is told to go forth and cause people not to see and not to hear and not to understand. But now when the servant comes forth, they're going to turn to him and be healed and they're going to see. Now I want you to see the term the many. Verse 14, just as the many were dismayed over you, were astounded, were, were terrified, were astonished. There are two groups of the many. The many who would be astounded at the servant of the Lord in this verse would be Israel, the people of the Lord. But then the many kings, the many nations in verse 14 will also close their mouths. So the nations and Israel are gathered. We go into 53. Who has believed our revelation and over whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? The arm of the Lord. All throughout Isaiah 40 through 55, the arm of the Lord is this, this picture of, of military might and military strength that accomplishes the purposes of the Lord. It, it, it's referred to as bringing the people back from exile. It's referred to in this section 40 through 55 of defeating Babylon. It's referred to as bringing judgment and salvation, not only to the Israel, the people of God, but the nations of the earth. And so to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He grew up like a young shoot before him and like a root out of wasteland, a root in a desert place, he had no form and no beauty that we should have looked at him and no appearance that we should have desired him. We did not esteem him. When we look at him, we do not see the arm of the Lord. We do not see the kingly presence of the Lord. We see something else. As a young shoot, a shoot is a, a suckling that comes up from a root at the base of a tree. And you know what we do with that. When those roots uh, sprout these little suckers, you cut them off. But what happens if the tree itself is cut down? If the tree itself is cut down, then those very shoots are the life of the tree. And remember, again in Isaiah 6, and you see the parallel between 1st Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah, the stump is cut down, but there's life in the sprout. There's life in the shoot. And the shoot becomes a messianic title, the branch, the shoot the sprout of the Lord. We see the, the root uh, of, of Jesse in, in Isaiah 11, speaking of the Messiah. Also, he's a, he, uh, this figure is called a root in the wasteland, in the desert, and that's Israel. Israel was birthed in the desert when the Lord delivered them from Egypt. And so this, this servant is reliving the history of Israel. He's going to accomplish what Israel was called to accomplish and failed, and that's why Israel's in exile. He was despised, forsaken by human beings, a man of suffering, familiar with sickness. He's a man of pain, the Hebrew word says. He is one who knows sickness. Now, there's going to be this this ascending scale of the relationship of the, of the uh, suffering servant with sickness and pain. A man of pain, a man who is acquainted with sickness. Now, remember, these verses, verse 3 and the next verse, verse 4, Matthew uses to describe Jesus' healing ministry. So on level 1, Jesus is acquainted with illness. He's acquainted with pain. He's acquainted with sickness because he confronts it in the human beings to whom he ministers. But he was despised, forsaken, a man of pain, familiar with sickness, and like one before whom one covers one's face, despised is repeated, and we held him of no account. We esteemed him not. 
We thought him to be nothing. We overlooked him. We missed him. Human beings look for greatness and power and kingly authority in different realms from Yahweh. Yahweh sees the servant who bears the suffering as the one who is accumulating divine authority to impart life and healing and righteousness and set people free from their oppression. He's despised, it's said twice, to underscore that. Truly, he bore our sickness and our sufferings, he took them upon himself. He bore our sickness, just as in 52.13, the Lord bore him up so that he, the Lord carried him so that he would fulfill the purposes of the Lord, so he would be high and lifted up. Now, because the Lord bears him, he can bear his burdens. And we have to understand that as members of God's people. The Lord will bear us up that we may bear up others. He bore our sickness, just as he's, for, on the first level, he's acquainted with sickness. On the second level, he bore sickness. There'll be a, another level in terms of sickness. And our pain, he took his, our pain upon himself. We held him to be one who was touched by the stroke of God and afflicted. When we saw him, we saw that God himself smote him down, struck him down. And that's a word uh, that has to do with plague. This, this, the, the relationship of the suffering servant to the plague is, is, is clearly being brought out into this passage. He is also humiliated. He's afflicted. He's the afflicted one. And it is from these verses that the, the rabbis called the Messiah the leprous one. That's the, the image of sickness that is, is, is understood in Isaiah 53. It's related to Moses and Moses' life. In our, in our sermon, we're going to tie Moses in, uh, in, in in many respects with the suffering servant here. He's, the suffering servant is a new Moses. The language here in Isaiah 52 and 53, there's a lot of language that traces back to the ministry of Moses. And remember ultimately how Psalms uh, 90 um, uh, you know, through through 106, book four of the Psalms, how the Psalms see Moses. He's a prophet, but he's an intercessor. And the language of Moses here is going to point to the ultimate beatification of the suffering servant in a way similar to the way Moses was beatified. Moses was exalted and lifted up and, again, given to us as a model. We're going to see this relationship between Moses and, Moses is an intercessor. He's constantly in the history of the Exodus and in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. He's constantly interceding for the people for their sin. But he was pierced for our sin, which could also mean profaned for our sin. It can also mean desecrated for our sin. The one, the Holy Lord, made the holy servant of the Lord unholy. He was desecrated for our sin, smitten because of our transgressions. The rebuke leading to our healing, to our peace, lay on him. And through fellowship with his woundedness, we have received healing. So the, the suffering servant is becoming a, a, a figure, an, an, a mediator, that th this figure, the sin, of the, of the world is put upon him and he becomes a mediator for us. Our sin is put on him and what we gain from his being desecrated, his being smitten, his being rebuked, we gain fellowship with the Lord. We gain healing. We gain forgiveness. And you see, all the words for sin, the, the, the three main terms for sin are being used throughout this passage and they culminate at the end. The three main words for sin, there is debt, guilt. Guilt and debt is, is, is one word for sin because the product of iniquity is that there is guilt and that guilt means we are indebted to God. 
We are indebted to our fellow man because of our iniquity, because of our sin. Transgression means crimes. It's, it's our crimes. And the final word is just sin. So our, our guilt and debt is dealt with, our crimes are dealt with, and our sin is dealt with. We all wander around like a herd of small cattle. We wander around like sheep. Each of us has taken his own way, but Yahweh has allowed to fall on him. Again, the guilt, the debt for our sin all comes upon him. We're going our way, but the suffering servant is going the way of the Lord to bring us all back to the way of the Lord. He was oppressed and bowed down but does not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is dumb before his shearer. He does not open his mouth. First of all, the suffering servant, the servant of the Lord in the midst of suffering, walks in silent submission to the Lord. He does not complain. He does not lash out in his pain. He does not seek to get others to feel his pain. He is silently submissive. He has been taken away, away from the land of the living. Let me me get this in another translation here. By oppression and judgment, he is taken away. And as for his generation, who considers it? He was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. He's removed. Not only is he judged, but his, very, his whole family is judged. No one even looks for any good to come out of his offspring, his seed, his generation. He's taken away. He's taken away uh, from the land of the living, uh, excluded, condemned. Justice is removed from him. He's struck because of the sin of his people. He's given a grave among criminals. His identification, this innocent one, no deceit in his mouth, no violence in his heart. But he is given a place of a criminal. And it's very interesting that the Hebrew here, associates the wicked with the rich. You know, it's interesting. The word wicked is, if, if you spell out the word, um, if you spell out the word wicked, it would be the word rasha. And if you spell out the word rich, it's the word asher. It's the wicked backward. It's the same exact letters and it's just backward. And what it's really saying here is his, his grave was with the wicked rich. You know, there's, there can be an assumption from the Old Testament, there can be an assumption in human culture that rich people are therefore justified. Uh, rich, if you're rich, it's because you're blessed, it's because you're righteous. Isaiah 53 takes a different perspective on that. Being wealthy does not guarantee that one is righteous. And then finally, the, the final three verses but it pleased Yahweh to let him become dust. It pleased Yahweh to crush him, and Yahweh has caused him to be made sick. We go from being acquainted with sickness to bearing sickness to now the Lord himself makes the suffering servant sick that we might be healed. When he makes his soul a guilt offering for sin, the soul of the suffering servant now becomes the very guilt offering. The guilt and, and guilt, the guilt offering had to do with recompense. Compensation was owed. When human beings sin, their sin affects God and their sin affects other people compensation needs to be made that's the asham offering the gift off or the guilt offering that needs to be offered to the lord 
compensation is made for injuring the Lord and compensation is made for injuring others. But the suffering servant makes his soul the guilt offering. But it pleased the Lord. The Lord made a determined, willful decision that brought pleasure to the Lord to make the soul of his servant a guilt offering. He would pay the compensation to God and to fellow human beings. He would be restitution to God and to human beings for our guilt and for what we owed God and others for sinning against them. He desecrated him. If he gives his life, if he gives his soul to wipe out our debt as an offering for sin, and then those very descendants, that family that was, de- that was just said, not only will the suffering servant pay, but his family, forget it. The Lord has a different solution. He will see his descendants and Yahweh will make his days long and Yahweh's good pleasure will succeed and prosper through his hand. Not only will he not lose his seed, his seed will become powerful and prosperous. And then we see three more times the many the many who were spoken of as two separate groups in 52, verses 14 and 15, the many Israel and the many nations and the many kings that would look at this servant. Out of his anguish of soul, he shall see and be satisfied. He'll see his seed. He'll see this impartation of life to others. This is the key. He not only covers their sin and forgives their sin and he pays their debt, but he imparts life to them. He imparts life to them. Out of the anguish of his soul, my servant shall see his seed and he'll be satisfied. He'll be satiated. He'll he'll have have a, a meal of rejoicing and joy. By his experiential knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will make the many righteous. They will be accounted righteous. So now we see the many again. And the many who are separated from God, the many who stand in the courtroom of God's judgment, the many nations who are separated from Israel and look aghast at this disfigured servant, they, first of all, the many will be made righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. He'll carry. He will will carry by himself. He will cause. He He will carry. He will take upon himself the debts. They will be made righteous and there will be debt removal, year of jubilee, inheritance, termination of slavery, debt removal. Therefore, I will divide him as an inheritance, the many. The many will be declared righteous. More than that, the many will be the inheritance of the servant. And he shall divide spoil with the strong. The spoil that the the, the the nations of the world attain by conquering other people through violence. The servant has violence perpetrated upon himself and he receives the spoil. He doesn't receive the spoil by perpetrating violence on others. He receives the spoil by violence being perpetrated on him. Finally, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the criminals, he canceled the debt, he was numbered with the criminals, he bore the sins of the many, just as he bore their sicknesses, just as the Lord bore him up, he will now bear the sins of the many. And he makes intercession for the transgressors. He's beatified by becoming an intercessor. The the verb tenses here, 
He bore the sins of the many. All that act is in the past. Those are past tense verbs. But the verb for making intercession is that he will continue to make intercession again and again and again. And when we see Jesus in Hebrews 7, the image of his priesthood is that he has an eternal priesthood because he lives to make intercession for his people. The death of Christ, the bearing of the sins, our being imputed the righteousness of the Lord, that's a past act. It has taken place for us. Our sins, our debts are canceled. Our crimes are, we're declared innocent. Our sins are forgiven. But the one thing the Lord continues to do is to make intercession. And so with that, we will, <laughs> Jan and I, I spoke way too long. We're going to close with, a, with a, a few minutes of prayer here. Lord, you are the suffering servant, and we thank you all that you have done for us. Because of you, we can return from exile. Because of you, our debt is canceled. Because of you, Lord, our sins are forgiven. Because of you, though we are criminals, we are declared innocent, Lord. And because of you, we stand here in this hour of crisis, Lord, in this hour of great crisis in our nation and in the earth, knowing that you are interceding for us, there's going to be an impartation, not only of righteousness, but an impartation that we might become the servants of the Lord. Make us into the servants of the Lord, Father, in Jesus' name. And Jan, if you could close. And Lord, I just appreciate all that you have done for us. Because by sacrificing your life, you have given us life. Thank you, dear Jesus, for, for what you took upon yourself, knowing the cost it would be for you. You did it willingly. Thank you, Lord. May we walk. May we walk in appreciation. May we carry your light to the world. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you again. We appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, brother. Now we're going we're gonna to close down for oh, about 10 minutes or so here. We'll be back at 11 and we'll do the communion and I'll do part two of this message. Uh, part two is going to then take, see Isaiah 53 is on two levels. It's the level of what Jesus has done for us. But then Paul sees the servant of the Lord as being part of apostolic ministry. There's a second level where now what Jesus was for us those of us who are raised up to lead in the body of Christ, we become for the church and for the nations. We become that. We now help to complete the ministry of the Lord in the earth. Mm -hmm. And the key is going to be through intercession. Mm -hmm. As he became an intercessor forever, we enter into that intercessory ministry and we begin to impart life to the church, to raise up disciples and to bring others, as Jan says, into the family of the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you in 10 minutes or so. Amen.